ladies and gentlemen, welcome the moderator of the next session, Roland Freudenstein. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Um, indeed, I'm Roland Freudenstein, policy director of the Wilfried Martens Center for European Studies in Brussels. And in a few months, I will join Globsec as vice president and head of the Brussels office. So a triple welcome to all of you here and to you um, online to uh, the uh, session uh, on a topic on which everyone is an expert, which is political extremism goes virtual and international. And uh, that's what we want to discuss with you today. Um, we have two speakers right here in the studio, and we've got three speakers online. And having only 50 minutes, that is a challenge. So let's be disciplined here. And um, I will uh, actually introduce the speakers very briefly. And then we do a, a Slido poll, so be prepared for that. And then we start with individual questions to the speakers. So we have online from New York City, David Ibsen, who is the executive director of the uh, Counter Extremism Project. We have Daphne Halikiopoulou, uh, who is also online from Reading, who is professor of Comparative Politics, University of Reading. We have the third online speaker, Michael Chertoff, the chair and co-founder uh, of the Chertoff Group, and last but not least, the former Secretary of Homeland Security in 2005 to 2009 in the United States. And he's also online from Washington. Uh, here in the studio, right next to me, we have Ivan Bartosz, um, the chairman of the Czech Pirate Party. And there are people who are saying that he is going to be the next prime minister. So remember, it might be a historical moment. Um, and last but by no means least, Simeon Tsomokos over here, um, the founder and president of the Delphi Economic Forum in Greece. So um, I again would like to remind you to be uh, brief. Um, you also can ask questions, um, but keep the questions brief. Um, and um, questions can be asked in three ways. Uh, this would be in the room here. Just raise your hand, wave at me, I'll see you. And um, then you have to, you have to uh, take, uh, come to the microphone, actually. I think we're, oh, this is the microphone, right. That's where you have to come if you ask the question in the room. There's also the option of using the Slido app uh, or the Slido function on the Globsec app. And finally, there's a possibility to connect via Zoom to the virtual studio. So, um, but before I ask my initial kickoff questions to the five speakers, I would like to do a Slido poll with you, the audience. And um, the, the question in the Slido poll, can we bring that up, please? Um, the question is, what do you think is the main driver for the rise in right-wing extremism? Um, and there are, there are four options. It is um, social media. It is the raising the increasing economic disparities. It is the mutual support of authoritarian governments and parties. So kind of the international angle, if you want. And here's a little provocation. Maybe it's the illiberalism of the woke left. And you all know very well that this is a thesis brought forward by many uh, uh, right wingers themselves. So. Please uh, give from, from, uh, from uh, uh, classify these or rank these four options in such a way that we see which one uh, will be judged the most important by you. We're going to come back in a, in, a, in a few minutes with the results. And now um, let, me, let me start with the, the, uh, the topic and the questions. And of course, we're going to ask why uh, right-wing extremism is growing at all. 
We're going to discuss the role of social media. We're going to discuss the international connectivity. And of course, most importantly, at the very end, the question of how to respond. So um, let me begin with Ivan Bartosz. As a Czech politician, Ivan, how do you assess the impact of right-wing extremism in Central Europe? And how serious a threat is it for our democracies? So, Floor is yours. Thank you for the question. Uh, I have to admit, considering the Europe and liberal democracy, and maybe the future of many democracies in the world, that we are at war. Uh, that's obvious. Uh, I'm happy, and it's kind of fortunate, that Czech Republic does not face the serious threat of right-wing extremism compared to, for example, in Poland, Hungary, and uh, V4 countries, even Slovakia. But uh, what we are facing is that the extremist topics are carried by the populist, which results in the same disappointment of the people. And almost any narrative, almost any topic that hits the ground, considering politics, considering the European Union, uh, future of the nation, <clears throat> or economic questions, even COVID, was directly taken by the populist and multiplied by whatever forces are involved. It could be Russian money, it can be influence of China, but it, it can be also particular uh, race to the election uh, motivation and it just uses similar algorithm that, uh, let's say, the original alt-right movement is using. So we don't have to really distinguish how the, let's say, bad feelings within the people is supported if it's originated on the right wing or the other wing. But uh, the direct impact is uh, building mistrust to the institution, to the democratic politics, to elected politicians, and it can easily, and it's not my words, and I believe it was somehow rephrasing Václav Havel, like if you sleep in democracy, you may wake up in a totalitarian system, and all those changes that are happening are finally, and we had this historical experience through democratic election. So addressing either right-wing movements within the Europe, generation identity, which is huge movement through Greek and uh, through the to the other nation, uh, not hitting directly Czech Republic, is just the uh, same as addressing any, let's say, disturb, disruptive, disruptive and carried by the social media uh, thoughts and movements. We have to do it wisely with respect to the freedom of speech, but also this is a serious threat and the wars in the future are the cyber wars and disinformation wars and a knowledge society, which we turn in from information society, deserves our attention locally on a European level and we've got a lot of guests here obviously worldwide. Thank you so much. Um, excellent uh, kickoff. Um, there are so many other angles so I'm going to pack them into the questions to the other speakers and then I do want an exchange with you here and with you online uh, about, about these uh, questions. So the next question goes to Michael Chertoff in the United States. Um, Let's take a look across the pond, as they say. What is the relation between Trump and the alt-right? I mean, how much alt-right is in Trump, in other words? And um, maybe as, a, uh, as an afterthought to this, how threatened was American democracy on January 6th at the time of the <clears throat> storming of the Capitol? So, Michael Chertoff, floor is yours. Well, and I have to say, I also agree with what uh, uh, Mr. Bartosz said about uh, right-wing extremism. I think in the United States, we've always had a group that we would describe as alt-right, goes back for many years, uh, but it's been more or less below the surface and has not gotten a lot of attention until recently. And I think two phenomena really elevated it um, in public perception. Uh, one was Trump because Trump explicitly courted the right uh, after the Charlottesville a March where someone was killed by a right wing extremist in a car. Uh, Trump described the right wing as very good people. And he used very thinly coded language that echoed some of the racist uh, and authoritarian leanings of the alt right. 
I also think, to be honest, the virus and the lockdown further exacerbated the situation because some people resented the fact that they had to wear masks <clears throat> or that the opportunity to attend things in restaurants and bars were shut because of the lockdown. And I think that further fueled the fire. And this culminated on January 6th. And as I think the prior speaker said, a lot of what right-wing extremism is about is creating distrust and undermining social cohesion. And in the wake of the election in November of 2020, Trump's refusal to admit that the election was conclusive and his con continuing to raise the claim that it was stolen and there was fraud, even though literally dozens of courts looked at the evidence and said there was no evidence of serious fraud, that further created fuel for right-wing extremism. And what we saw to our shock and horror on January 6th was really nothing less than a coup attempt, an effort on the part of extremists encouraged by Trump to break into the legislature and to physically injure or harm the uh, members of Congress who were voting to ratify the result of the election, which they're required to do, in order to stop the election from going forward. And I must say that to watch this, I felt like I was watching something in a, in a fascist state where people don't let the election go forward. The good news is that the coup attempt failed. And now the Biden administration yesterday issued a strategy against right-wing extremist and domestic terrorism. We've now mobilized the FBI and the intelligence community to treat this as the number one terrorist threat in the United States. And I think we need to have a global joint effort to deal with right-wing extremism, which is becoming an international phenomenon fueled by social media. And to be honest, also made worse by the fact that you have disinformation emanating from Russia and China. Thank you so much uh, for, for this introduction. And I want to actually stay with this international aspect here and ask uh, the next kickoff speaker, um, uh, Daphne Halikiopoulou, is there such a thing as nationalist internationalism? In other words, isn't there a contradiction in terms here? Uh, I mean, we all know that uh, uh, you know, nationalists, uh, let's say, like from in Brazil and in some European countries may get along. But how about European countries that are neighboring each other and sharing a difficult history? How can nationalists cooperate between those countries? And how important is this whole international aspect in, uh, in, the, in the, the growing strength of right wing extremism? So, Daphne, the floor is yours. Yeah, hello. Hi there. Uh, thank you for your question. Just before I address it, I want to say I thought your uh, sliding poll was really interesting and I'm very curious to see what, uh, what the results w will be. Um, but OK, so nationalist internationalism, indeed, I, I think it's an interesting way of framing it. And you're absolutely right. There's a contradiction in terms, right? So on the one hand, the far right, as I prefer to call it, uh, owns the nationalism issue, right? That means that it emphasizes the nation, the, 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 the in-group over the out-group. So any international endeavor is by definition not uh, their priority. However, there are some, some ways that these, these uh, the two terms, if you like, or nationalist internationalism can coincide. And that is uh, both in terms of extreme right groups, but also in terms of the more moderate far right parties that we see even in power or in, or, or in, 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 in parliament. So, for example, um, many extreme right groups uh, actually have many branches. So, you know, things like Combat 18, for example, they, they function, they have branches in the US, in Canada and in a, a number of European countries. I think similarly, some of these groups uh, interact quite a lot online and this gives them a platform to have members engage and, uh, and discuss and spread their ideas. So this, I think it's, a, it's an accelerating, if you like, uh, role that it plays, that it allows people to spread the message really quickly through these international links. Now, in terms of political parties, one thing that I've noticed quite a lot in my work is how they copy 
each other. So the, the, the internationalism comes into into finding a message that, that one party sort of, for example, spreads in one country and then another party thinks, so oh, this is successful, so I will copy it too. A, a famous example is, I uh, don't know if, if, if the audience is familiar with the Swiss SVP, the, the poster they had in a previous electoral campaign of a, of a white sheep uh, on, a, on a Swiss flag kicking out the black sheep. And obviously this, this has been copied, so it's been used also from uh, the German NPD. And it's, it's this, this idea of what I call civic nationalism, this message that we need to exclude those who are intolerant of us and our beliefs and our democratic values has been taken up by a lot of, um, a, a lot of European far-right parties. So this is the, the copycat internationalism, if you like. And then, and then finally, there is also the question of forming alliances. So these parties, they have a, a grouping in the European Parliament and, and they try this way to form alliances and, and, and to compete with other parties, both in the system, but also in the European Parliament. But what I do want to say to end my response is that I think while this, as I said, can be an accelerating uh, question of accelerating the message. I don't think it's a structural issue that is able to gain them support. And I think if when, when we do touch upon the question of, of the causes of support, I think these are far more um, uh, structural and, and far more deeply ingrained um, than that. I don't, I don't think in, inevitably their nationalism is a weakness because that way they will never really be able to forge proper international alliances. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daphne. Could we have the result of the Slido poll now? Just asking our colleagues. There we go. OK, so social media is considered the biggest driver, uh, followed by uh, increasing economic disparities and then the mutual support of authoritarian governments and parties, <laughs> if you want the internationalism. And finally, the smallest factor is the illiberalism of the woke left. Well, some right-wing extremists would deeply disagree with this, but um, that's what we're here to discuss. I would like to continue now with uh, the next kickoff speaker, David Ibsen. And indeed, uh, we would like to focus on this, this one factor that was considered the most important by you, uh, social media. And, uh, and the internet. Um, and uh, I would like to ask you, David, how important are social media for the growth of right-wing extremism? Are they more of a driver, more of an accelerator, or just a vehicle like any other instrument that is being used? Uh, David, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Roland. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, but it's, it's not black and white. Um, obviously, um, you know, social media, internet platforms uh, permeate every aspect of our lives these days. So, you know, as tempting as it is to blame every negative externality that has arisen in society, um, every disappointment, um, every outrage, uh, to lay that uh, at the feet of Mark Zuckerberg, as tempting as that is, um, I don't think that we can do that uh, exclusively. So I don't know if terrorism and extremism um, uh, is caused by social media, you know, per se in a, in a vacuum. Um, but we do have to acknowledge that um, it is a accelerant, it is a facilitator in terms of allowing extremists on the far right and elsewhere to uh, communicate, to expand their networks, to propagandize, um, to recruit, uh, even in some cases to, to raise money. That's just uh, the nature of the platforms. Um, so when you look at it, it's really kind of a, a two-pronged answer. You know, do extremists misuse social media? Do terrorists misuse internet platforms um, to grow and, and to expand their message and to expand their membership? Yes, absolutely. Um, on the other side, are social media companies and internet media platforms, are they doing enough to curtail this, this misuse? Because uh, it's not just to say enough that terrorists are, are using social media to expand and recruit and propagandize. You also have to look at the platforms themselves and what steps are, are they taking um, to curtail this type of use. And if, if they're not stepping in in the appropriate ways, if they're not taking the opportunities to curtail such misuse, uh, then obviously they're part and parcel um, to the problem of extremism um, online. Just on the, on the first issue, by nature, social media uh, platforms, they connect people, people with similar backgrounds, people with similar interests. 
They're also exclusionary in terms of once you get into a group on social media, it's very easy to uh, exclude um, opposing viewpoints, moderating viewpoints. So it's the perfect platform for these kind of in-group dynamics that the previous speaker um, uh, just, just uh, announced. Um, it's also a great environment for these kind of propaganda and ideological feedback loops. Um, so the information comes in, it gets circulated, you can drown out kind of, again, moderating voices uh, and perpetuate the kind of process uh, of radicalization on these, these platforms. The last speaker also kind of mentioned, and this goes to the question that you asked, the ability to kind of communicate outside of, of your community. And one thing we've seen um, with the extreme far right and the creation of these transnational right wing networks is the use of social media to connect outside borders. Um, the extreme right wing used to be very community based. It was very ethno nationalist based. And now we've seen that there's this kind of transnational creation of these groups where you're putting aside these national differences uh, in favor of an adoption of a more kind of transnational identitarian um, uh, ideology um, that can unite people on really racial bounds as opposed to, to, to national uh, bounds. And so, yes, when you see, when you find different attackers <clears throat> who are motivated by uh, right-wing motivations, they're drawing upon um, manifestos and motivations and tactics that may have occurred uh, in different countries, and they're citing each other, whether it's in uh, Germany or Norway or, or Poway or El Paso or Christchurch, you kind of have this commonality of messages and this commonality of tactics. Um, on the internet, I would also note that there's really this, and this really is kind of a, a digital native phenomenon, um, the growth of um, this neo-Nazi accelerationist type movement, which is amongst younger neo-Nazi members and extreme right-wing members, um, where there's this subculture of, of, of memes um, um, and, and music uh, and symbols where you have this now you can see that you know uh, a member of the far right in um, in the US who might have previously been part of a neo-confederate secessionist movement is kind of adopting the same language and the same skull masks and the same imagery um, as an extreme right-wing member um, in Germany or from some kind of Nordic uh, resistant movement so th the platforms clearly are being used to facilitate this type of activity I would just add that as I mentioned in, in my opening of my remarks, you have the tech companies themselves, which I think because of ideology in one hand and the business model on the other hand, may not be doing enough to identify and interrupt this, this type of activity. On the, um, the culture aspect of it, there's this kind of libertarian utopian mindset that means that the very nature of connecting people will always result in positive outcomes. It will always lend to democracy movements. And, there's taken a while to, re to realize that their platforms can be used for good and bad, just like any kind of communication system, and that's been a hindrance. And we also look at the business model, which really is about keeping people on the platforms as long as possible, engaged as long as possible. And this leads to the deployment of certain methods, certain algorithms, which draw users uh, to more incendiary, controversial, um, conspiratorial type content, which certainly doesn't uh, mitigate the effects of uh, the radicalization amongst uh, these networks. So certainly, um, ultimate responsibility relies with the individual extremists and the terrorists who engage in these activities and propagate this ideology and commit uh, terrorist uh, attacks. At the same time, we have to look at the social media companies who operate these platforms and, and question whether they're doing uh, enough and taking sufficient steps uh, to mitigate and pressure and disrupt this kind of extreme right-wing activity. Thanks, David. Um, and uh, I already have a couple of questions from the audience here. Um, I will nevertheless, first of all, take our last speaker um, from, from the kickoffs, um, Simeon Tsamokos, and ask him, Simeon, in assessing the rise of right-wing extremism, leftist analysts and actors, politicians, like to emphasize socioeconomic factors the rise of poverty, the rise of uh, the dispar rising disparities between poor and rich, uh, between countries uh, in the pandemic. So it's all, it's all about the economy, stupid, if you want, in their eyes. And then you have, you have more conservative uh, commentators, such as, for example, Francis Fukuyama, with his recent book, Identity, who explain the rise of right-wing extremism by identity politics and actually more cultural questions. 
questions of how, how groups look at each other, how groups are treated by the rest of society. And, uh, and this also ties into the fourth option on the Slido poll that I put in there, the illiberalism of the woke left. There is a whole school out there which claims that it is the intolerance of wokeism uh, starting with U.S. universities going to also British and continental European universities and then uh, media and, and, and political establishments, uh, which causes people to counter-react. And what we see in right-wing extremism is just a reaction to that. So these are two schools of thought, and I would like you to kind of offer a synthesis. You're Greek, so give us a synthesis, please. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. And I thank uh, Globsec, actually, for this opportunity. I hope that we'll find some working relationship between this important event that you organize in this part of the world. We are emerging as a, we like to think, as an important event in Southeast Europe. So I hope that we find <coughs> joint efforts that we do jointly together. To respond directly to your question, I will speak actually as a citizen rather than you know, as an expert. I don't consider myself, myself an expert because uh, being a conference organizer, sometimes we see things horizontally. We don't have the time to go in depth. But I would like to say that undoubtedly both factors that you mentioned are feeding each other. Uh, the rising inequality in the last years has led a whole group of working class citizens unprotected and unsafe, if you like, to monumental changes that are, we are all are experiencing nowadays. Jobs are being shipped overseas or becoming obsolete. To mention what happened in Greece, 5% of the total population, the youngest, back during the most severe economic crisis we have had, they went abroad. I mean, you know, and we had a huge brain drain, which I don't know how we're going to bring back all these people. Therefore, the big debate at the time in Greece uh, was whom to blame. I mean, the weak and confused policies of the governments at the time, the economic elites of the country with their fat, you know, salaries, etc. So that was where a lot of extreme left wing and extreme right wing rhetoric converged. This is, this is my view. And the huge changes on the economic front created also rapid changes in the social norms. The rise, I think, in my view, of the neo-fascist group in Greece, you remember the Golden Dawn, was only made possible during that period of time. The situation was also fueled, of course, by the uncontrolled immigration, which is a major issue, I think, and is going to come in the years ahead, unfortunately, and especially the creation of the immigrant ghettos we have had in many parts of Greece. The absolute lack of integration policies created the rise of these forces. And needless to say that this was turbocharged by the internet and the social media. The, that, that was what happened in Greece. It is a fact, I think, that we all live in times of the eventual collapse of the social structure of the past century and the rise of individualism, which has weakened people's sense of belonging. This is my thought. For example, less people are members of political parties or trade unions. Even football clubs see their membership falling these days, especially in younger generation. There leaves a gap of representation for many people, and extreme right-wing groups are eager to exploit this psychological factor. I feel that modern societies are fragmented and common experiences are dwindling. Many people without a well-paying job feel that all that is left to do is to defend themselves against the elites and whichever themes these elites are in favor. My last point, which is a rather question, it is not a, you know, a remark, and perhaps later on we can discuss is. What is the role of the political leadership in all this? Because I have to tell you what is happening in Greece these days. The uh, far left, the far right party is not getting more than 1% of the polls compared with 10% that it was getting a few years ago. And even the uh, left party, I mean, is very weak these days. So I would like to ask the experts, because I'm not an expert, I must tell you, what is the role of the political leadership in all this discussion that we're having this morning? Thank you very much. Excellent question to end an answer, um, and uh, we will certainly debate that in the remaining 20 minutes that we have here. Uh, I would now like to take some of the questions that came in here uh, through the uh, Slido function on the Globsec app, and um, I would uh, try to bundle them a little bit. There are two concerning extremism and terrorism. Um, it, it, there's, there's one, um, I mean, actually, uh, it, it both should go to Michael Chertoff. 
so why does it appear so much harder to prosecute and convict far-right extremists on terrorism charges? And the other one is, um, what can we do about terrorists operating through international and national legal fronts? That is to say, NGOs and getting funding for them. So this is obviously the question to Michael Chertoff. Floor is yours. Thank you. Well, first of all, the good news is if you look at what's happened in the wake of January 6th, <clears throat> I believe over 400 people have been charged with various criminal offenses relating to the uh, violent acting out that we saw at the Capitol on January 6th. So I do think we're going to see a rise in cases. Now, we don't actually have a specific domestic terrorism criminal statute. But we have a number of other criminal statutes which easily apply, uh, including hate crimes and violations of civil rights and obviously, uh, you know, act, other acts of violence. So there are plenty of legal avenues <clears throat> available to the government. And as I said earlier, uh, the administration has now unveiled a strategy to make domestic violent terrorism a priority in counterterrorism. And that means uh, collecting more information, coordinating with state and local officials, <clears throat> and coming up with effective strategies to prevent and disrupt terrorist activity, and also to divert people who are beginning to move in the direction of violence away from that and essentially to deprogram them. So that, I think, is very effective. In terms of NGOs or um, international organizations that are supporting domestic terrorism. Um, at least I'm not aware that we've seen a lot of operational support at this point um, internationally for U.S. domestic terrorists from overseas. We've seen moral support and we've seen people going online and encouraging it. And as I said earlier, some of this, I think, is actually driven by particularly the Russians. But I don't know that we've seen financial support or operational support. But I do think that, again, as we increase the focus on these particular violent threats, we will certainly uncover any support domestic terrorist acts at an international level with operational or financial assistance. OK, thank you very much. I would now, before continuing with the questions I got on Slido here, I would like to give the floor to uh, someone uh, uh, connected to us via Zoom from India. And please introduce yourself very briefly and then ask your question. Floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Vivek Mishra from the Indian Council of World Affairs. This is a government think tank here and the oldest think tank uh, dealing with international relations and other related issues. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the health of democracy. Uh, increasingly, we are seeing populism both on the left and the right fronts uh, making home uh, inside democracies and the health of democracy. Um, on the, uh, you know, on one side, you have issues like cultural nationalism and conservative politics versus the left populism that we have, um, which are so-called pro-people issues. Uh, and they are stacked in democracies increasingly in, in, in the global south. Uh, against one another. Now, and, and if you leave these two out, then there is, uh, you know, the risk of elite politics thriving uh, between these two extremes. So how do we reconcile all these for achieving a deeper democracy is what uh, I'm asking today. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And thank you for the question. I would like to give that to Ivan Bartosz. Well, how healthy is our democracy? And, and how would you answer that question? Uh, it also, thank you for the question. And it also, I will use... Uh, that part of the speech as was on the very beginning. What can politician actually do, right? And uh, it's regaining the trust. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, and it's the way how we want to do politics, is just, you know, you have to act transparently. You just cannot lie, not even within the campaign, because the lack of trust to the politics and uh, politics they represent is just based on you don't lead by example. That means you don't have to be like a super nice guy. You know, you can be tough politician, you know, fighting the crime. You know, you can, in a fair political discussion, beat your opponent with arguments, right? It's 
everything is legit, but you cannot lie to the people. Uh, and uh, I believe, and it wasn't mentioned in here, but why you are looking for identity by yourself? Because you cannot be proud of your work. You don't see a future in your commitment to the society. Then the extremists online, and even some politics within our democracy in Czech Republic, emphasize that feeling within the people, threat threatening them you know, with no future, with migration crisis, which completely went around the Czech Republic. It didn't hurt us. People were passing to Germany. Sorry to the German people. And uh, once you use that, it's just never, never ending circle because you are captured in them lies. So first you have to give a future to the people. They can believe themselves. They can be happy about their life. And then you have to regain the trust. If you take a look to the north, when the government is open, not just open access data, but if there is an issue, you describe the issue, no matter how bad it is, and you describe the people the way how you're going to solve it. It's a partnership. And it was a little bit mentioned in there, but that, let's say, even suffering part of the society never had you know, this understood, understandable voice of them it was often ignored, and that makes a place to actually extremists and populists to just, you know, pick up the glove and use it in the campaigns. And as far as I believe, you cannot have ambition to change a society. It's, it's just an optimistic approach if you don't believe to the individual. And this regaining the trust and then social media can help us because politician can broadcast himself widely. He's not dependent even on the, uh, on the public, uh, public media. And it could be used as a tool by politicians to actually fight those extreme wings in politics. And one thing that was mentioned in here as a tool, remember when there was Arabian Spring, we all believe that social media helped people to organize themselves against regime. You know, even in the Turkey, Turkish opposition, but then when it was captured by the totalitarian government or specific leader, it was abused to actually put people in jail and control the narrative and use the propaganda. So each technology can be abused, used in a good way, but in very end, you get to the individual on one side as a citizen and to the leader. So as long as we can adapt, lead by example, especially through truthfully described issues and your politics, you can regain the trust. And we've got almost nothing to afraid, except the terrorist organization, which uh, the fight is their everyday life. They actually don't want to introduce the change because that fear is what feeds them. Provided they don't forget when they come in power, Ivan. Yeah. Because sometimes you know what happens. Yeah. But I totally agree with you. I mean, regaining the trust is a very important component. Of it's the easy to lose, yes. it's hard to regain. Indeed, so, so indeed. We, we, we've got, it, yes. it's heating up now here in the, in the Slido function. Uh, so we have uh, 12 minutes left. So let's, uh, let's really shorten our answers. And I would now like to, uh, to ask the censorship question. Ilya Shashku asked uh, how to find the border between fighting the extremism in the internet and total censorship. Also has something to do with the uh, illiberalism of the left, because you know that some right-wing narratives are that the big tech companies, in fact, impose a, uh, a biased uh, uh, a kind of censorship on social media, which is why you have to create your own or whatever. Uh, so I would like to ask David that question. Uh, David, wh wh where is the red line between, between censorship and reasonable uh, 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 defense against extremism? I mean, that's a great question. It's the million dollar question. It's something that everyone has been wrestling with, I think, since the advent of these these social media platforms. As Ivan said, you know, any communication tool can be used. It can be used for good. It can be used um, um, uh, for for nefarious purposes. I mean, I think one example of this is in the U.S. is in the case of of Donald Trump. Um, you know, again, the speaker mentioned how individuals can use social media to communicate directly to the people uh, to bypass kind of these entrenched um, political structures that may not be responsive to uh, the needs of, of people who don't have the proper access uh, or money. Now, some people can see that as a wonderful thing. 
Now you have Donald Trump, who communicated directly with the people. He bypassed 17 other establishment candidates in the Republican primary. And he, he defeated uh, Hillary Clinton, who basically represents the political establishment uh, in the United States, um, you know, pretty much for, for, for a generation. Other people see this as a huge affront to democracy. I mean, some people see Donald Trump as basically the standard bearer for white supremacy uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, and have taken action really to, to um, limit his use of this uh, social media function really for, for that purpose. Um, so it kind of goes back to, to this issue of, you know, uh, finding some kind of, you know, moderation between the, 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 the people who want to use these platforms to communicate directly to the people um, and also defining in some sense, you know, what is a misuse and what is a nefarious purpose of, of the Internet. On the latter case, I don't think it's always as complicated as we make it out <clears throat> to be. Social media companies promulgate terms and conditions, uh, terms of use for their platforms. Um, they routinely have identified things, um, whether it's from um, adult consenting pornography to calls to violence um, to uh, distribution of CSAM material, things that are prescribed on the platforms, and they deploy um, individuals and also technologies to curtail this type of activity. For some reason, when it comes to forms of, of other kind of political speech or extremist speech, um, the companies are less likely or less inclined to utilize these same tools to prescribe that type of activity. So I think that all reasonable people can come together and say, look, you have these terms of conditions, you have individuals who are designated as terrorist um, uh, individuals by the UN, by the EU, by the US, for example. Um, obviously, they shouldn't have access to these type of platforms. That's in line with the social media companies' terms and conditions and the rules, and it's also in line with, with common sense. And I think if we refer back to these rules and to common sense, um, it, it would be less problematic um, of a debate. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I, I have a question for Daphne here, and it concerns the factor of religion. We haven't talked about this so far, but I think it is, it is quite significant. And the question by Amanda Coakley from Vienna is how much, in your opinion, is the far right supported or influenced by ultra-conservative Christian organizations? Daphne, what's the answer? So thank you. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this opportunity to link this question with some of the things that I've heard being talked about uh, in the panel generally about the, the causes of the far right, religion being one of them, I think. So the, the short answer to this question is some, some role for some particular country. So the, the, this is mixed. There is variation. Um, it, it is quite closely linked in certain countries. We know, for example, that, uh, that a lot of these parties are closely linked to some whatever religious organizations. We also know that in, in, in some countries, uh, the far right is, is more secular. And so there is variation. And I think just to, to broaden and put, put my political scientist hat a second and, and, and broaden it, I don't think I, think, I think what's important to emphasize here is that, that it's not one factor. One thing I've heard in the panel being talked a lot about is the people. So essentially we have this idea that the people vote for one thing for one reason, but that's not the case. There is no such thing really as the people. Societies are or consist of various social groups with different preferences, often clashing preferences. Now what the far right has done is that it has managed to, to, to gain broad coalitions from many different societal groups who support them for different reasons. Others for religion, because they are ideological voters, or nationalism, also because they're ideological voters. But others, again, for economic reasons or for trust reasons. I, I agree with Ivan there. So these are the protest voters. So I think that what we need to understand is that in order to, 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 to address the far right, what, what we need to do is break these coalitions. So instead of focusing on one, one factor alone, I think we need to understand why different core and different peripheral voters support these parties for different reasons and how these coalitions of voters can be somehow uh, broken. Thank you. Thanks, Daphne. Now, five minutes remaining. This is your last chance, you people in this room, to ask a question at that microphone. And if no one steps up to the challenge, then yes, ma'am, please, would you come here, briefly introduce yourself, and then quickly ask your question. <coughs> we have to work with a microphone because otherwise the online participants can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. 
Yes. yes, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Jana Kriteswa, I'm professor at the University of California. So uh, I like to talk about the role of technology, uh, but a little differently from different point of view. Um, Technology aggravating fears and insecurities of voters, voters losing jobs due to offshoring, outsourcing, or maybe simply due to China trade shock, and you know, giving the votes to populist uh, leaders who promise protectionist policies, etc. So, how what do you think, um, in your view, should governments do to address uh, this fear stemming from? technological revolution in terms of, I don't know, fiscal policy or industrial policy or social policy, right? And we also, you know, we've seen that, um, for example, President Biden's, I know I'm closing, uh, Biden's uh, fiscal um, stimulus was kind of, um, you know, a step in that direction. Uh, so I would appreciate your views. Thank you. I would like to give that question to Ivan Bartosz. What would be your social and economic policy answer to the phenomena of marginalization and, 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 and uh, uh, anti-globalization -global movements that we see? Uh, okay, we have to consider that globalization is just a fact. It shows us in a COVID, there is nothing like specific, you know, island of uh, positive deviation that would not be touched by the global changes, either it's climate or it's a virus. Obviously, uh, it's a prosperous society. Uh, we were talking about extremes on the left, on the right side, their combined rhetorics, adding the Catholic religion or whatever reason, anti-vax, anti-masks. Uh, you have to found uh, the sufficient line of the politics, a little bit left, a little bit to the right, that actually leads to the prosperous society, which is free market that generates, you know, options for the people and the, the treasury of the country. And then you have to have very strong, and it's not a, in the way, in a bad way, it's social, social system is often in Europe, think something is wrong, but obviously COVID showed us how many people could not make it. So the rich society that generates the prosperity of the country, thinking of those people for whatever particular reason cannot reach the average wealth of having a good job, sufficient education, and that's the role of the state. And we are members of the European Union. So that role, and there was a China threat of economic growth, we could, you know, and we will, I believe, address those issues together. Our big concern is environmental responsible politics. We are talking about uh, maybe future of the, of the carbon tax that brings the companies back into Europe because the only uh, advantage they've got that they are in the countries of a cheap labor and no environmental responsibility that they, they have to deal with. So this common approach of not extremist solution and uh, very pro-people oriented in the matter of fact, there are a lot of people who just cannot adapt to 21st century changes, and obviously they will not, because they are either on the side of the society or they turn the age when the change and adoption is very difficult for them. That's a combination. Great concluding remarks. I would like to uh, formulate the takeaway here. And uh, if, you, if I had to put it into one sentence, it would be, as there are many reasons, many factors involved in the rise of right-wing extremism. There are also many factors involved and many aspects to the response to it. And we have, of course, in insufficient time, but we, we have touched upon a couple of those points. And these are, I would say, the, uh, one of the major buzzwords was leadership, leadership by politicians that has to be exercised better. Um, uh, th 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 there are socioeconomic policy answers. Uh, there is also the, the question of uh, a better regulating uh, social media and the internet, and, and that will take the cooperation of many actors. Um, respect of groups, uh, however justified or unjustified you feel their resentment or their, their grievance may be. Um, and last but not least, and maybe the most difficult buzzword here, trust. Uh, how to re-establish the eroding trust in our societies. Now, 
I think with all, like with all interesting debates, we finish with more questions than answers, but, but we, we may still be confused, but on a much higher level, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> I hope. So uh, thank you for, for being here. I would just want to announce that in 10 minutes, we have a session right here about the winners and losers of the pandemic. Um, and and uh, uh, sorry, it's five minutes, I just hear. Uh, and uh, in Maria Theresia, the other big room, there will be a session of you from Central Europe, future of the European Union with the foreign ministers of the Visegrad countries of Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary and Poland. So I want to, I want to thank you all for being here. Thank our online colleagues, uh, David, Michael and Daphne. And of course, our two speakers here in the room, uh, Simeon and Ivan, thank you all and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait.